Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, and the Bellarmine Jesuit Retreat House present Father Michael Sparrow in The Attitude of the Beatitudes, Virtue versus Vice. We continue now with Father Sparrow's second talk. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. St. Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, If there's any encouragement in Christ, any solace in love, any participation in the Spirit, any compassion and mercy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, with the same love, united in heart, thinking one thing. Do nothing out of selfishness or out of vainglory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, each looking out not for his own interests, but also everyone for those of others. Have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave coming in the form of human likeness and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's the beginning of Philippians chapter 2. It's one of the passages that Pope Francis was indirectly referring to when he said, put on the mind of Christ. That's St. Paul urging each one of us, put on the mind of Christ, take on the attitude of Christ. And so we come to the first of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, and the promise For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Poverty of spirit is the pathway to virtue and holiness. Poverty of spirit is putting on the mind of Christ. It's the attitude that Jesus exemplifies coming into this world as a little child, exiting this world as a naked man nailed to a tree. What these two images share in common, the image of this absolutely vulnerable child born in a cave with only shepherds and foreign travelers worshiping him, or the naked man nailed to the cross, he's not going to harm anyone. They're images of radical vulnerability. They're images of radical poverty of spirit. The first and perhaps the greatest of the Beatitudes, it's the keystone on which the structure rests, is this poverty of spirit. That's the attitude of the Beatitudes. That's where we begin. John Stout, in his book, The Message of the Sermon on the Mount, writes, right at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus contradicted all human judgment and nationalistic expectations of the kingdom of God. The kingdom is given to the poor, not the rich, the feeble, not the mighty, to little children humble enough to accept it, not to soldiers who boast that they can obtain it by their own prowess. As Father Barron says on his commentary on discipleship, when he's reflecting on the blind beggar of Jericho, Bartimaeus, He says, we're all beggars in the spiritual life. That's the starting point. We come before God as a beggar, recognizing that everything that we have is a gift. Poverty of spirit is not beating ourselves up. It's not putting on some false mind. It's just recognizing the truth. Everything you have, your good looks, your intelligence, your good health, your genetic structure, the body that you have, where you were born, 
the parents you had, the education that was given to you, all of that is gift. And the recognition that it can be taken away in a heartbeat. I belong to a charismatic prayer group, and one of the men who has come to that prayer group, he's since died, but he came for a number of years, was a guy by the name of Fernando, quadriplegic in a wheelchair, couldn't talk, couldn't move, is totally dependent on his wife and his caregivers. I didn't know much about Fernando, but he became seriously ill, and his wife called me over to his home. She's a very humble woman. I just assumed that they were living in a very humble home. I came over, and there's this magnificent home that they're living in, in a very wealthy neighborhood. I said, what happened to Fernando? She said he was a neurosurgeon at the top of his game, and he had a stroke, fell backwards, severed his spine, instantly became paralyzed. One day at the top of his profession, respected by all, making big bucks, commanding a lot of respect, next day reduced to absolute dependence on others. I say that not to frighten us. I say that to say this is the reality of our life circumstances can change so quickly. And so the Beatitudes begin with the recognition of everything that we have is gift. And so our attitude in the face of that is one of gratitude and one of continuing to ask for what we need, begging in the imagery of the blind beggar Bartimaeus, begging for what it is that we need to grow closer to the Lord. And when we do that, that's the place of truth. And ironically, it's the place of power. It's not a place of diminishment. It's a place of real power because we recognize where the power comes from. Michael Crosby, in his book, The Spirituality of the Beatitudes, Matthew's Vision for the Church in an Unjust World, writes, The kingdom of God can only be received by empty hands. Jesus warns against two things. A, worldly self-sufficiency. You trust yourself and your own resources and don't need God. And B, religious self-sufficiency. You trust your religious attitude and moral life and don't need Jesus. I got myself. What else could I need? That was Satan's attitude. Satan's other name is Lucifer. Lucifer means light bearer. Lucifer was the greatest of God's creations. He was beautiful, he was strong, he was powerful. And he fell in love with himself, said, I don't need God. Peter Kreft, in his little book, Back to Virtue, writes, We are to be spiritually poor only for the sake of becoming spiritually rich, detached, from what we can own so that we can be attached in a different way to what we cannot own, detached from consuming so that we can be consumed by God. That imagery of detachment and attachment is central to the spirituality of St. Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius lived from 1491 to 1556. He was born into a wealthy, landed Spanish family. He was the youngest of about 12 kids. His mother died when he was young. His father, overwhelmed with trying to raise a household of kids, sent him off to the Lord Treasurer of the kingdom. He was apprenticed to the guy who held the purse strings for Spain at a time when Spain ruled the world by their military might, and by their pocketbook. And Ignatius was connected to that epicenter. And so he grew up learning all the things in courtly life, dancing and dueling and cursing, swearing. And he was filled with pride. He was good looking. He was very proud of his long blonde hair that draped down to his shoulders. He was very proud of his fingernails, which were fashionable for gentlemen to have them manicured at the time. And he was especially proud of his figure and the long boots and his felt figure. So that as he walked down the aisles, all the eyes of the ladies would turn and say, ooh, 
<laughs> he came from a military family. His brothers were sea captains going over to the New World. And when they came back and they told stories to young Ignatius of their exploits, their traveling the great waters and their exploring this new continent, just fired Ignatius' imagination. He was the runt, and yet he wanted to excel his brothers and his exploits. So he entered the military, he gets a military command, and he's guarding this castle between Spain and France, and there's a border skirmish. The French horribly outnumber the Spanish. Now, any military commander with an ounce of military strategy would have negotiated a settlement, but not if you got something to prove. Not if you're the youngest and you got to prove that your stick is the biggest and the tallest and the strongest. Your sword is the most powerful. So against overwhelming odds, Ignatius fights on bravely in the proud, proudest sense of the term until a cannonball comes over the rampart and literally shatters both of his legs. End of battle, negotiated settlement. But the French respected his military machismo and they carry him back to the castle at Loyola. And within a day or two, they set his leg on the battlefield and Ignatius looks down and he sees that his leg is badly set and that one leg is longer than the other and that a bone, because it was a compound fracture, the bone is sticking out. So he orders the doctors to re-break his leg and to saw off the bone. Because why? He wouldn't be able to wear the hip boots and walk down the aisle and have all the ladies say, ooh. <laughs> Pure pride on his part. It wasn't the battle in the wound that almost killed him. It was the surgery after the battle, having his leg rebroken and the bone sawed off, that almost killed him. He came within a hair's breadth of dying. Didn't look like he was going to recover. And the doctors said, you better make your last confession because, honey, I think this is it for you. That night, Ignatius had a mystical experience. And in that experience, his heart was broken open and he began to see his life in a new way. Now, it would take nine months for his full recovery and he would walk to be sure with a limp for the rest of his life. He would talk about that as God's gentle reminder of his own pride and his own vainglory that had almost cost him his life. But in the course of that nine months, Ignatius totally turned around his life. What he saw as a value before was no longer a value. He would later write in his autobiography that up to the age of 30, he excelled in three things, womanizing, gambling, and dueling. Those were his three big claims to frame, womanizing, gambling, dueling. I can get any woman I want, the love of the risk, and dueling if anybody dared assault his honor. In fact, Ignatius was arrested once or twice, usually for a fight that he instigated. The one instance that is well documented is he got into a fight with a priest because the priest insulted one of his brothers. And so he beat up the priest almost killed the guy. And the only reason he got out of jail is because he was politically well-connected. Power then as power today speaks. He was not a nice man. But he underwent this conversion in those nine months of reflecting on who am I? What's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? Where's my life going? And in the midst of that reflection and further reflection in a cave over the next couple of years at a spot in Spain called Manresa, he would write what came to be known as the spiritual exercises. The imagery, just as the body needs to be exercised, so the soul needs to be exercised. And at the very beginning of the spiritual exercises, Ignatius writes what he calls the principle and foundation, the first principle. This is the starting point. It's the foundation, the point on which the building rests. What does he have to say in that principle and foundation? 
This is a contemporary reading of that by David Fleming. Ignatius writes, the goal of our life is to live with God forever. I think you can spend a whole retreat just thinking about that one sentence. The goal of our life is to live with God forever. Why are we here? What's the purpose of our life? Is to live with God forever. It's not how many toys we get. It's not how big our bank account is. It's not what our zip code is. It's not how many degrees we amass. It's not how many people think we're wonderful. It's not how many people we sleep with. It's not how much drugs we consume or how much alcohol we consume. The goal of our life is to live with God forever. God gave us life because God loves us. Our own response of love allows God's life to flow into us without limit. So I like to image there are doors on our hearts And when we open those doors, God's life can flow in. When we close the doors of our hearts, they're blocked. And God will never beat down those doors. Those doors have to be opened from within. We have to choose God. We have to say, Lord, I want your life. Again, in the imagery of the blind beggar Bartimaeus, Lord, I want to see. I want to see my life in you. Or in the words of Thomas Aquinas, I want nothing but you, Lord. That's what I want. This is what Ignatius challenges us at the very beginning of the spiritual exercises. He says, what's the desire in your heart? What is it that you want? It's hard to get at that because we have so many desires, so many wants. They're floating all over the place. Ignatius says, keep going down. All right, yeah, I want a nice home. Yeah, okay, I I want a nice spouse. I want children. I want a good job. I want to be respected. I want to be healthy. Okay, 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 okay. Keep going down. What do you want underneath that? What do you want underneath that? Do you get to this most fundamental of desires, the one desire that will last? I want this union with God. As a result, Ignatius writes, all the things in this world are gifts of God presented to us so that we can know God more easily and make a return of love to God more readily. All is gift. As a result, we appreciate and we use all of these gifts of God insofar as they help us develop as loving persons. But if any of these gifts become the center of our lives, they displace God and so hinder our growth toward our goal. Here's where Ignatius is at his logical best. In everyday life, then, we must hold ourselves in balance before all of these created gifts, insofar as we have a choice and are not bound by some obligation. We should not fix our desires on health or sickness. Did I read that right? We should not fix our desires on health or sickness, wealth or poverty. Obviously, he's not American. (laughs) Success or failure. Hasn't he read Horatio Algier? A long life or a short one. He should talk to my doctor. (laughs) For everything has the potential of calling forth in us a deeper response to our love in God. Our only desire and our one choice should be this. I want and I choose what better leads to God's deepening life in me. I want and I choose what better leads to God's deepening life in me. Let me just remind you of what I just said. Ignatius didn't come to this sitting in the chapel. He came into this reflecting on his life and the choices that he was making that almost killed him because of his pride, because of his glory his desire to be esteemed by others, where did that lead him? It led him to death. And in the nine months of his convalescence, an extraordinary grace is being given to him. The doors of his heart were open to say, what's most important is this connection to God. That's what I want. At the core of who I am, That's the one thing that I believe will make me happy. And everything else flows from that. If that's the foundation on which my life is built. If my life isn't being built on that, I'm building my life on sand. And the whole structure is like 
a house of cards that can keep tumbling down. What about us? What's most fundamental to who we are and what it is that we want? The temptation that was given to Adam and Eve in the garden is the temptation that is given to each one of us. Eve eats, Adam eats, it's the fall of the human race. With the temptation, you will be like gods. You will escape the limits of what it means to be a human being. You'll call your own shots. You'll be in control. And there's part of us that finds that always seductive. Because to be in this life as it is right now, us as children of Adam and Eve, it's a life of limitation. We're going to get old. We're going to get sick. And something is going to get us. We don't get out of this life alive. And it's that reality that Ignatius would have us reflect on at the principle and foundation. It's that reality that I believe is right at the core of this first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We know who we are. One of the key meditations that Ignatius would have us contemplate in the spiritual exercises is imagine yourself on your deathbed. Imagine that you're breathing your last and you're looking back at your life. And from that perspective, what would you change in your life? If you know that it's just about to end, it clarifies everything. And you look back and you say, dang, I wish I would have got that new car. <laughs> Darn, I wish I would have just finished that report at the office. You know, then I could die in peace, huh? Wrong. It's the relationships. It's the people we care about. It's the values that are most dear, that should be, that we want to put front and center in our life. And yet, as we live and life happens, that which is most important and the people that are most important get pushed over to the side. Blessed are the poor in spirit who know the truth of our lives. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is not future tense. This is now. The words of the Beatitudes are in the present tense. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Shakespeare's play, As You Like It, he has a rather cynical character by the name of Jaques, who's a melancholy philosopher. But he has this brilliant synthesis of human life. He says there are seven stages of life, seven ages of man. And we come into this world as a little infant, and as he so delicately puts it, mewling and puking in our mother's arms. With little kids, you always have to be careful because there's, you know, always something going to be shooting out from some opening in their bodies. You never know what's going to come out. Well, that's how we enter this world, absolutely dependent. And then we go through and then we become the school kid and then we become a little older and we're the lover and then we become the soldier and then we become the judge. And if we live long enough, we get back to this second age of childhood where everything is taken away, sans eyes without eyes, sans teeth, sans hearing, a second childhood. That's the cycle of life. We start out utterly dependent, we end utterly dependent. I admire my dad very much. He died back in 98. His dad died when he was 12 years old. My dad became a self-made man. He owned his own company, was very successful. My dad's motto was, if I'm going to join an organization, I may as well be in charge of it. <laughs> Why would I want someone else to be my boss when I could be their boss? That was my dad's motto. He was very good at what he did. And then he got cancer. There were only two times that I saw my dad cry. The first was when his mother died and he was very close to his mother. And the other was when he got the news that he had cancer. And I was shocked. I'd never seen my dad cry. And he said, Michael, I'm not afraid of death. But he said, the thought of being stripped away and being utterly dependent on others, he said, I, I, I can't handle that. 
It took 12 years going in and out of remission before the cancer eventually got him. But in the end, my dad's worst fears were realized. First, he couldn't walk without a walker, and then it was a wheelchair, and then he lost control of his bladder, and then he lost control of his bowels. He was always a bit deaf, <laughs> and so, but then his hearing went, and then his sight went, and then he couldn't feed himself. And then when my mother couldn't take care of himself and he refused to allow anybody to live in the house, she had no choice but to put him in a nursing home. His absolute worst fear that he'd even be stripped of his own home. In the end, everything was taken away. My dad fell into a depression in the midst of that because he was used to calling the shots. He was used to being in control. The big C in his life was not the cancer, it was loss of control. I think many of us, especially men, can identify with that. When we're not in control, when we're not in charge, it's very, very difficult for us. I presided over the funerals of four men, and in each case, it was because they lost a job, or they were humiliated, and they lost their sense of self-respect. One guy who was a friend of mine fell into lust. He had an affair. The affair was discovered. He was humiliated. He couldn't live with that. He ended up hanging himself. Another man, university professor at Loyola University that I work with, got bad reviews from the students. He felt humiliated as a result of that, took his own life. Another man lost his job, tried for over a year to get a job, couldn't get another job, said, I can't provide for my family, they'll be better off without me, took his own life. My friends, this is not some pious, esoteric philosophy that has nothing to do with real life. The Beatitudes have everything to do with real life, how we live our life, what's of value to us, what sustains us, what puts fuel in the engine, what keeps us going. The promise of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, when we embrace our own poverty and we know who we are, nobody can take that from us. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're living in the kingdom right now. And there's a sense of peace and serenity and hope. That's the lives of the saints. And don't think of the saints as some plaster statue. The saints are us who are living this reality right now. And when we embrace that truth, the Beatitudes become immediately apparent as true in our life. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <laughs>